Hello, today is Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. Companies face big challenges today making sure that their employees can access emergency services when they dial 911. On top of that, ensuring that accurate callback and location information is transmitted with each 911 call, well, that's particularly difficult as companies deploy technologies like voice over IP, which dramatically increases the mobility of their employees behind the PBX. Now, for many years, the enterprise clients of TC2 and LB3 have come to us for assistance in dealing with the complicated compliance issues associated with varying state 911 rules for businesses. And now, new federal regulations were recently adopted that apply to businesses operating in any state across the U.S. So, today I'm joined by Andrew Brown, who is the managing partner of LB3 and the chairman of TC2, and he also happens to be a longtime subject matter expert on 911 issues, particularly as they affect enterprise customers. Andrew, thanks for joining me today. Joe, it is a pleasure, as always. So, Andrew, this seems like a bit of a mess for enterprises. Now, You've been working on 911 issues for, gosh, as long as I can remember. So can you help make sense of what companies need to do now in order to comply with 911 regulations, new and old? Yeah, well, it's definitely a complicated compliance exercise and a bit of a mess if companies don't keep the big picture in mind. And the big picture is that employees may need to contact emergency services from the workplace. Pretty basic. They need to be able to do that by dialing 911. That 911 call needs to go through. And when it goes through, the emergency services on the other end need to receive accurate callback information and reasonably accurate and granular location information of the caller so that emergency services can find them. Right. But doing that is a lot more complicated than it sounds. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated for a lot of reasons. You know, the workplace today can mean a lot of different things. People don't just work nine to five from an assigned office or cubicle. They might be in a hoteling office environment where they move around a lot in their own office. They might work from home. They might even work from the local coffee shop. And in any of those cases and many others, they can do all of that by using their company's communications infrastructure. But that infrastructure doesn't necessarily have any proximity to the actual physical location of the caller. And they might be making that 911 call over a lot of different technologies or devices that just aren't traditional wireline phones. So what do these new rules require companies to do? Yeah, good question. So first of all, let me point out something that you started with, and that is that the new rules were adopted by the federal government. And they apply to businesses operating multi-line telephone systems in every state. That is a big deal and a really big shift. The federal government had never previously imposed those 911 obligations on regular businesses that weren't telecom providers, leaving that to the individual states. So the new federal rules cover a lot of familiar territory in the 911 world, and they basically require companies to address the two major 911 issues, ensuring that employees can access 911 when they dial 911, and also ensuring that location and callback information is transmitted with each call. So why don't you explain each part a little more? Yeah, sure. So companies have to ensure that when someone dials 911, the call goes out to 911. No prefixes like dial 9 to get an outside line. And the call has to actually go through. You can't redirect it to some facility on site or somewhere else. And lastly, this part gets a little tricky, companies also have to transmit a contemporaneous notification that a 911 call has been made. And that notification has to go to someone that is on site or maybe off site, but that is familiar with the facility from which the 911 call originated so that they can assist emergency services personnel when they arrive at the location of the caller. Okay, I got that. But what about the second part, dealing with the type of location information that has to be transmitted? So the second part is more challenging for enterprises. They have to transmit so-called dispatchable location information. That's a defined term, and it means two things. First, the street address of the caller, and second, quote, additional information such as room or floor number necessary to adequately locate the caller. 
So there's this objective component, the street address, that has to go out, and then there's this subject component of additional information that is within the discretion of the enterprise transmitting it. And generally that discretion is a good thing for enterprises because they can decide what to transmit and whether they want to get very specific with a location identifier depending on the nature of their workplace and how complicated it would be for emergency services to find somebody. So the dispatchable location rules are pretty strict for traditional fixed devices, like a desk phone, which doesn't move around and therefore should automatically transmit pretty good location information. But for non-fixed devices, like soft phones common in the UC environment, the location can be established using coordinate-based info or even requiring the end user to enter that location information manually because it's really technically difficult to generate the information automatically and accurately when those devices are moving around so much. So it sounds like businesses have a lot of work to do. Do companies have to retrofit their systems and when do they have to get their systems in compliance? Yeah, good question. So generally the good news is that there is no retrofitting required and no major equipment forklift is mandated. We worked really hard to make sure businesses didn't get hammered with a sudden expense mandated by the government. All the rules we discussed apply prospectively for equipment installed after specified effective dates. So for the access rules, any systems installed after February 16th, 2020 must not require a prefix to be dialed before accessing 911, and they must pass the call through directly to local public safety answering points. For the dispatchable location rules, any systems for fixed devices, those are the desk phones, installed after January 6th, 2021, or for non-fixed devices installed after January 6th, 2022, must comply with the rules. Well, that's good. I mean, it does sound like companies have a little bit of breathing room. Yeah, they absolutely do. It only applies, as I said, prospectively for new installations. But let me share with you what I generally tell our clients, and it gets back to keeping in mind the big picture of 911 that I mentioned at the beginning. The new rules that we're talking about, they're basically a roadmap of best practices with respect to 911. And even if your company is not in compliance with them now, you should start taking measures, including investing the time and doing a network redesign, even deploying supplemental technical solutions to complete 911 calls, eliminating these dialing prefixes, and transmitting accurate and granular caller location information as soon as you can, even if you don't have to. Start now. These are all best practices to limit liability, avoid mishaps, and really to keep your company's name out of local news stories relating to a 911 call failure. And I'd also say not to forget that there are still about 20 varying state laws out there imposing 911 obligations on businesses, and those have not gone away. They aren't preempted by the new federal rules, and they impose on companies varying obligations to do the very types of things these federal rules require. All right. Thanks, Andrew. This is a lot of great information, and honestly, it's been very eye-opening. Now, if you receive our Staying Connected emails, Andrew and his LB3 colleague, Jeff Sheldon, have written a more detailed article about the rules, and that's linked in the email containing information about this podcast. It's also available on the newly designed LB3 and TC2 websites. So if you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to Andrew, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues. And as a reminder, if you like these podcasts, you can subscribe to them on Apple, Spotify, Google, and lots of other platforms. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn.